All right, everybody. I do believe we are live. Welcome to another episode of the Break the Rules live stream. I am your host, Lev Polyakov, and I am here with none other than Jason Riza Giorgiani, amazing philosopher, author of Lovers of Sophia, Prometheus and Atlas, novel Folklore, World State of Emergency. There are so many different books that I recommend everybody checking out if you have not done so yet. And this definitely goes for Jason's new one, which is Promethean Pirate. And in this book, Jason, you definitely open yourself up way more than I've ever seen you. The book is an autobiography as well as a continuation of a lot of the things that you talked about. And I want to uh, get this conversation started first by saying to everybody, Break the Rules brings all the different circles together. And if you want to support what BTR is doing, smash that subscribe button, smash that like button, and be sure to click the bell. And we are going to be doing super chats at the end, so make sure to send those super chats as well. We will be getting to those. But anyway, to get this started, Jason, you grew up in New York City. You were commuting from Queens to New York. And I think it's very important for us just to understand Jason Giorgiani, the man, how you got here, what kind of experience you've had to turn you into the person that you are today. So however you want to take this, uh, go go for it. Well, I'm not going to sit here and start narrating autobiography for you, Lev. you got to ask me some specific questions. By the way, very happy to be back on. Uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you and your audience. Um, you mentioned Queens. Uh, I don't want people to get the wrong impression. Yeah, like Donald Trump, I, originally I'm from Queens, but we only lived there until I was, what, uh, eight years old. At age eight, uh, it's between seven and eight, we moved to Manhattan. Um, so so we, we used to commute, um, you know, like up to when I was in first grade uh, because both of my parents had offices in Manhattan. So, so I was still rather immersed in Manhattan, even when we lived in Queens. And then we relocated to, uh, to here when I was about around about 1988. Yeah. Well, it definitely makes sense. Somebody like yourself would find themselves to be in uh, Gotham and resonate with that area uh, way more than uh, with Queens. And you asked me to be specific. I definitely will be specific. When you were talking about the experiences you've had with uh, latent psychic abilities, whether we're talking about like going through walls or being able to hear conversations that are happening from far away, can you go in a little bit on how exactly that developed, what exactly that was like? What was that like? Uh, well, as I write about in Promethean Pirate, um, there was this period for about let's say a year and a half or so where I started to develop what I suppose you could call clear audience around the age of uh, maybe, maybe 10 or, or so nine, 10, something like that. And uh, you know, we had a rather sizable living room between my room and my parents' room. And I was able to, at one point, you know, make out conversations in a normal tone or even a hushed tone of voice across the distance of the living room. And, uh, you know, um, I talk about the the kind of uh, tense situation in my household in, in Promethean Pirates. So I was kind of like focusing in on, uh, you know, the, the situation between my mother and my father on the other side of the house laying in bed, you know, pressing my uh, ear to the wall, as it were, to, to hear across the living room. And I, I got confirmation a few times that basically I, um, I had been able to discern the nature of their conversation at that distance, which is clearly not, you know, technically audible. And, uh, you know, this, this ability became somewhat of a nuisance, as I describe in the book, because even in crowded restaurants uh, in that period, I kind of could tune into various conversations. I mean, uh, tune in is not the right word. When my attention would drift amongst the tables of other people at a restaurant, I uh, became acutely aware of their conversations, which, which was annoying. It was aggravating, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I suppose you'd call that clear, clear audience. And then there was this one night where my attention was so in, 
you know, uh, focused on hearing, you know, what, what was across the house, uh, again, with my head pressed against the wall next to my bed, that I just rolled through the wall. And like I said in the book, it felt cold. The, the wall felt like my body felt freezing cold for a moment, rolling through this wall. And I rolled right onto the carpet in the living room on the other side of that wall. Uh, and then this rather interesting you know, experience unfolded with a kind of spectral hound in the living room. So I, I suppose that was what you know, occultists have called my astral body or whatever. And that this was a kind of uh, astral projection at very short distance from my bed into the living room. What would you say was felt as far as going through the wall, if anything, in terms of the texture of the wall? Were you able to feel like the interior? No, no, no. quick. Like, you know, just like roll. I mean, you know, the thickness of that kind of wall in a Manhattan apartment, it, it's not much of anything. Uh, so it was just a moment as if you would fall out of your bed onto the floor, except that there was this wall between my bed and the floor, the carpeted floor in the living room. It just felt cold for a moment going through it. And I do recall uh, you were also writing about in your book, Closer Encounters, unless I'm mistaken, that uh, the sense of feeling cold was also exhibited by people who were in various uh, supernatural phenomena. I'm not recalling exactly what, what part you're talking about of Closer Encounters. I do know that when I'm discussing the case of Linda Cortile, uh, November 30th, 1989, mass abduction in New York City, which I touch on again in Promethean Pirate from my own personal perspective, there are accounts that people, including Linda Cortile herself, who's the woman at the center of that case, uh, people have been basically uh, levitated straight through closed windows into flying saucers. And, um, and so some researchers have asked, is it really the physical body that's being taken in these instances? Or are these entities able to separate the, the um, astral body from the physical body? And is that what's being abducted? There are all kinds of questions about that, you know? Uh, so yeah, very, very interesting. When it comes to, and we are going to get to the uh, alien portion as well, but when it comes to these recollections that you've had in your childhood of uh, past lives, that definitely cements your view that reincarnation exists, and specifically the recollection that you have had of living as a very particular old man in a New York City apartment. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, who this uh, particular old man was and what really cemented this old man being uh, connected to you? Yeah, well, the strange thing is that it wasn't an apartment. It was a hotel room. And so so I so, well, let me back up for a moment, though, and just sure. preface this by saying that. You know, I have written uh, well researched, thoroughly cited academic philosophy, philosophy in an academic style for a long time. And among the various parapsychological um, uh, evidence that I have uh, drawn from in my writings are extensive studies of reincarnation by Dr. Ian Stevenson, who worked at the University of Virginia for several decades. Um, basically, he was a, a medical doctor, psychiatrist, and he studied cases of children who spontaneously had past life re recollections. And in particular, he focused on cases where there was a correlation between birthmarks and birth defects and the death wounds of the apparent previous personality. And mm -hmm. go, ahead, go ahead. I'm just thinking if somebody stabbed me in the neck then, but uh, that is, uh, you know, that, that is what it is. Yeah, well, these are cases where the kids remembered very specific death traumas and they gave other details of uh, what appeared to be their previous personality. And researchers would find somebody who, co who corresponded to that individual. And he focused on small towns because generally across the world, and especially in like the third world, uh, most people spend their entire lifetime in a rather restricted area. So Stevenson focused on small towns because it was easier to track down previous personalities that might correspond to the spontaneous uh, past life recall of children. And he was able to establish a, a correlation between 
death wounds as recorded in coroner's reports and the death trauma as recalled by these children. And, you know, I, I refer your viewers to these studies. The massive tome on this is Reincarnation and Biology, two volumes, vast study. Then there is basically like a, a condensed abstract version of it in a book called Where Reincarnation and Biology Intersect. Uh, then Stevenson also did some research on children who spoke, who had past life memories. And in these past life memories, they spoke languages that they had never had an opportunity to learn, which is called xenoglossy. There's a whole study on xenoglossy by Ian Stevenson. It's extremely thorough empirical research, which I had cited in some of my writings. And so my general tendency uh, over these years uh, doing work in philosophy has been to be an empiricist. And, you know, I, I was never of a mind to want to become the subject of, of research, you know, like that's not advisable, generally speaking. Uh, but I've come to a certain point in the development of my philosophical project where, you know, as you said, I decided to be a little more transparent about my own experiences. And so all of that was a caveat, you know, uh, by way of saying that I am not the kind of person, the type of thinker who would want to base anything on, uh, you know, anecdotal or entirely personal experiences. But it so happens that I have some experiences that do line up with phenomena for which there's tremendous empirical evidence, namely, you know, reincarnation, past life recollections. And so, yeah, I, I had these dreams when I was, uh, how old was I? Uh, I wrote it in Promethean Pirate. I would say maybe eight years old, something like that, eight or nine years old. Uh, it was sh right after we had moved to Manhattan, which is significant because my mother had an office in the garment district, okay? And uh, the garment district, uh, it's the sort of the west side of Bryant Park. And this is, you know, you'll see mo in a moment why this is significant. It's kind of the 30s. Uh, into the 40s on the on the west side of Manhattan. And um, so I think there's something about having gone to the area of her office and being in Manhattan again that acted to trigger these memories. And so I started having these recurring dreams, um, although I frankly, I would say they were nightmares because of the state of mind that they put me in. These recurring dreams of an old man, a frail, very sad, very lonely old man who was living out of suitcases in, um, in a hotel room. But the sense I got was that he had spent his entire life living out of suitcases in various hotel rooms. And so there was a sense in which he was homeless. And, you know, uh, there were vivid details in this dream. Pull really loose skin tight so that you can shave properly as an old man. Being in clothes that don't fit you anymore because the guy was emaciated and he, I suppose, didn't have the money to replace his suit. So he was wearing these old suits that didn't fit him anymore, pulling his belt too tight and so forth. And um, I had, uh, you know, uh, vivid visual imagery of him sitting in the lobby of this hotel next to an object that I could not identify as a child. Eventually, I described this to my great grandmother, who was alive at that, you know, who was a young woman at that time. And um, so I described this object that was next to a, a chair where this old man was sitting in the lobby of the hotel room. And uh, it was this like bron bronze, brass colored, filthy object. And I think, I think it stuck with me because like the guy was a germaphobe. And I had the impression when he was looking in this thing that he was thinking, oh, that's disgusting, you know? And uh, so she told me that th that's a spittoon, that in the old days, they had these spittoons that were, they had like a place to rest your cigarette or put out your cigarette, but also to spit tobacco into because people used to go around chewing tobacco all, all the time in those days. And so evidently there were these spittoons on stands in the lobby of this hotel. And subsequently, by the way, I finally found a picture while I was writing Promethean Pirate, a picture of the lobby of the Hotel New Yorker where these spittoons are set up next to these chairs. 
anyway, um, so I remembered this guy in this hotel, and there was a diner next to the lobby of the hotel. You could go from the lobby of the hotel into the diner. And this guy's teeth were falling out, so he would go and sit in the And um, I even got a sense of exactly where he was sitting in the diner. It turns out that uh, this diner is a diner that's appended to the Hotel New Yorker. And right outside the window where I had, you know, had seen this man sitting uh, is a plaque dedicated to Nikola Tesla today. Now, the, the other very interesting thing in that dream was that I remembered that the guy got hit by a car, and I think it was a taxi. And it was a taxi. I looked it up. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was because I remember the yellow checkers in the dream. It was quite clear. It was a yellow checkered car, and it had these thick grills on the front. These metal like bumper grill things that we don't have on. We haven't had on taxis for a very long time. Uh, and this grill hit his leg, and at least fractured it and he should have gone to the hospital. But I remember thinking in this dream that he didn't want to go to the hospital because he couldn't afford to pay hospital bills. And he didn't want anyone to know that that was the case uh, since he'd be humiliated on account of the fact that he was a known person. I mean, he, he would have... He, he would have been recognized and he didn't want anyone to know the condition that he was living in and that he was so poor that he couldn't afford to pay a hospital bill. So this fracture never really healed and he kind of hobbled about uh, with a, a cane after that. So, so anyway, I had these dreams for about a week recurring. And I, as I said, I would call them nightmares because when I woke up from them, to this day, with all of the horrible, various, let's say, the vicissitudes of my life, with all the things that have happened to me, and I've lived a tumultuous life, okay, I have never felt the depth of sadness that I felt when I would wake up from these dreams. I would have tears streaming down my eyes, uh, down my cheeks, you know, from the, the sense of forlorn destitution of this old man who felt like he had been abandoned by the world. And um, so, so anyway, I didn't know what to make of this. I had no idea what to make of these dreams. Didn't make any sense to me. Uh, my parents didn't want to hear about it. Up that way. And I was trying to explain to her, no, you don't understand. It's the past. I was that old man. This is the past that these dreams take place in. Anyway, uh, so, so I had no idea what to make of it until, let's see, maybe... 15 years later or so when I was in my uh, in my early 20s as a graduate student at NYU, I met this young woman from Paris. And um, I started I, I got involved on, on some level with this woman and I started having dreams about her where we were in the late 1800s around the fin de siècle period, you know, the Art Nouveau period. And um, she was a theater performer in these dreams. She was a theater performer. And instead of calling her by her name in this life, Marie, I would call her Sarah. And uh, we were speaking French and she would take me backstage, uh, like either before or after her performances to like be in the dressing room with her and chit chat with her. And clearly we were friends in these dreams and she was this major theater performer. And I finally told her this and Long story short, she explained to me why she had, first of all, she was shocked by what I said, uh, because she, uh, she explained to me that for various reasons, she had come to suspect that she was the reincarnation of, of uh, Sarah Bernhardt, the great early, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century um, actress. I mean, Sarah, Sarah Bernhardt was a Shakespearean actress of the highest order, uh, just famous and infamous in her time, a, a real, you know, femme fatale type. She used to carry around her boyfriends in coffins. She would use coffins to, to die to herself and become her character, you know, like in some kind of a ritual meditative practice. And then uh, occasionally she would transport some of her 
lovers in these coffins. Anyway, hell of a woman. And uh, Nikola Tesla was good friends with her. They were very close friends. She would, I mean, they weren't exactly romantically involved, but they were like very, very close friends. And uh, she would come to his laboratory often in New York in, in her later years. And uh, they had met in Paris um, before he emigrated to New York and then and later resumed their relationship uh, when he had his laboratories there downtown in the city. And um, anyway, after I met this woman, I started having these dreams. I started getting a flood of all these other memories. And it occurred to me when these images would come to me of like, I, I, I'll give you one example. Walking through really dark city streets at night, much darker than now. Like, uh, you know, the, the street lamps were, were f more widely spaced than they are now. And just there weren't as many lights as there are. It, it, it was dark and there was a sense of like sketchiness and that the streets were a little bit dangerous. Uh, and I was walking through um, the streets with this, I think it was kind of rain. It had rained and the streets were wet with this dossier case, uh, the dossier holder underneath my arm, this portfolio. And the portfolio was full of these science fictional drawings, uh, sketches, schematics. And I remembered that I had just come from a meeting in a boardroom where I was presenting these concept drawings to a group of businessmen. And the thought in my mind very vividly was, they think I'm crazy. They're not gonna. They're not gonna back me because they think I'm crazy. And I was very concerned about this. That I wasn't gonna get this funding because these people believed I was too eccentric. Anyway, there were a number of these memories that came to me, and it was immediately apparent to me, you know, phenomenologically from the quality of the experience, that this was the same person who was that old man who died alone in that hotel room. And by the way, I also remembered that that old man would. And that these were the only people, he, the only people that he had a connection to at the end of his life were these pigeons that he would go feed in Bryant Park. Anyway, um, so yeah, it was the same guy. It was the same guy. And another memory is I remember commuting through Grand Central, I'm um, sorry, uh, Penn Station, the old Penn Station. It was yeah, the, the most, beautiful one. Uh, I mean, it was the most magnificent neoclassical structure, certainly in New York City. And I have color, vivid color recollection that came to me in that period in my early 20s of commuting through that station on the way to work in Long Island. And like, it, it, it's, it's so vivid uh, the way, like th there was a map, there was a map inside the station and the way the light would hit it, like it was already getting old and yellowing, but it had like a gold tint to certain parts of the map that would shine and shimmer in the shafts of light coming through the windows of the station. Anyway, so yeah, uh, yeah, Penn State was demolished in the 1960s to build this hideous Madison Square Garden and the rat's maze underneath it that they, that they dare to call Penn Station today. Fortunately, now they built Moynihan, uh, you know, terminal in, in, you know, on the other side, they turned part of the post office into some attempt at replacing the old Penn Station and, and doing some kind of aesthetic justice um, for that tragedy. Anyway, so, so yeah, there's a few examples of, of these uh, kinds of memories that I had. Now, when it comes to the process of going from the body of Nikola Tesla with all of his inventions and all of his knowledge of death rays and such into let's say in this example your body you were mentioning in your book quote the soul is like software it can be copied and its code can also be split it is not some indestructible and self-identical essence so my question here is and this goes to the question of uh setting up a pirate organization, developing psychic powers, all that good stuff that I want to get into. But when it comes to knowing what other people are thinking and yielding some kind of a mutual understanding from that, I'd be very interested in getting your take on where exactly the individual lies in this whole scenario, because I know you are extremely pro 
individual, but you're also talking about the soul as uh, being able to be uh, split apart. So what exactly am I missing here that's going to make this a little bit clearer on how exactly this process of reincarnation works? What exactly is the individual? Let's put it that way. Okay, so let me back up for a minute and start at the very beginning of your question. First of all, um, for, for those who've read Faustian Futurist, you know, uh, and for those who haven't, um, in that book, I initially in a fictional form, right, uh, putatively as a work of fiction when I wrote it, I talk about the life of a man who was the reincarnation of Nikola Tesla and who was born in... Um, 1947 and committed suicide in 1980. Uh, and so, so my sense, and I, I go back to this in Promethean Pirate as well, my sense is that there was another life after Nikola Tesla. And it was the life of a, of a young man who was resisting being captured by some kind of a uh, vast nefarious operation um, that, that was wise to who he had been and that was trying to use his, use the information locked in his mind, you know, and use his capacities and talents for purposes contrary to, you know, anything that he would have ever stood for. So, so there is this, memory I, I have of a, a life in between, which I wrote about in Faustian Futurist. Now, there's a lot of, there is a lot of uh, uh, embroidery in that account. A lot of Faustian Futurist is embroidery, is fiction, okay? But there are some core fragments of memory, which, by the way, has a very different quality from imagination. I mean, just go back and try to remember your very early childhood uh, experiences, right? There's a certain quality to those memories. It's very different from just spinning a yarn in your own mind imaginatively. In any case, uh, there are these few fragments of memory of, of this life of a person who I called Nikolai Alexandrov. He was allegedly Russian. And then he <laughs> finds out that, no, really, his family is not Russian. They were Ukrainians. And it's complicated. They belong to an espionage operation. Anyway, so, so there was this life in between, right? Now, what I suggest in Promethean Pirate and, and what I think I've been able to put together after a lot of time and, you know, agonized thought about these things is that the people who in Faustian Futurist I depict as spinning a spider's web around Nikolai and trying to capture his life, those people were already targeting Nikola Tesla in his last years in the Hotel New Yorker. They, they were um, basically international fascists who were already preparing for a Fourth Reich, for an occulted Reich to continue after the defeat of Germany in the Second World War. They had deeply penetrated the OSS uh, in the years before it, it then was fused with the uh, spy organization of General Reinhard Galen and turned into the CIA. The Central Intelligence Agency is a hybrid of our American OSS with a Nazi Eastern European spy network run by General Reinhard Galen, which tells you a lot about the motivations and aims and worldview of the CIA at its foundation. Anyway, so these these OSS people had taken out rooms on the same floor as Tesla, uh, uh, the 33rd floor of the Hotel New Yorker. And I believe that they were trying to get inside his mind. That they, see, and Tesla's infamous for this. He didn't write down a lot. He did a lot of his work in his mind. And so it would have been very difficult to, to understand some of his technical drawings, right? He even failed to take out patents for various things. And so, you know, interpreting the, to what technical information he did put down on paper would have been very hard without access to what he was thinking. And I, and I believe that, you know, uh, these OSS people on He would walk and who he might try to meet or whatever. And by the way, I also believe that this business about the pigeons and they make it like he was just some lunatic, you know, uh, who fell in love with pigeons. No, 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 no. Tesla was from Serbia. Uh, 
at a time when the Serbs still used carrier pigeons for communication. And he had been trained in the use of carrier pigeons to send messages. And it, there's enough evidence to uh, make the case that he was in, in his late years, around 1935, I believe, uh, he was entrapped by Nazi agents who claimed to be uh, who claimed to be officers of the Amtor Trading Corporation, a Soviet acquisitions firm working in capitalist countries to bring capitalist technology back to the USSR. And this Amtor Trading Corporation had an office in New York City, and they had, after Tesla had attempted to sell the particle beam weapon to both the United States and his home country, Yugoslavia, to defend against the Nazis, he finally despaired of, of you know, uh, uh, being able to help out the allies. And he said, well, look, at least Stalin's against the Nazis. I'll sell this weapon to the Soviet Union. And he signed this contract, which is dated April 20th, Hitler's birthday. And initially, at any rate, the Russians denied having ever signed this contract with Tesla. And so I believe it was a fake contract. And the reason, the reason that they did this was because they wanted to create grounds for stripping him of his naturalization. Okay, so when Nikola Tesla died, his property was handled by the alien, uh, the, the Office of Alien Property. Mm. His, his effects, his personal and effects. And Donald Trump's uncle as well, right? Yes, his, Donald Trump's uncle was involved. Um, but, but the important point is that his effects were handled by the Office of Alien Property. Why the hell would that be the case? He was a naturalized citizen of the United States. Well, because we weren't told they stripped him of his citizenship. I believe he was accused of treason for signing a contract putatively with communists, but actually with Nazis to hand over a particle beam weapon to the people he was trying to use the particle beam weapon in order to protect the West from. Yeah, right. I would have thought that he would have known better because of all the, you know, sending to the gulags, like all this information. I don't think it was hidden from somebody, especially like uh, Tesla. Although, don't, that, be, yeah. don't, don't be so sure. You're talking about an 80-something-year-old man mm. wasting away in a hotel room who in a lot of ways did not have his wits about him anymore. And, you know, that to the extent to which, I, you know, he would have been looking at, I don't know, political news stories or, you know, uh, reports of dissidents from gulags or whatever, I doubt it very much. And frankly, mm. on that note, let me also add that, and this comes across in Promethean Pirate, I would say that the man was very politically naive in, in the best way, in the sense of being a very hopeful humanist. There were a lot of ways in which he was very politically naive and did not think technologies and what kinds of dangers they, they posed to you know society reminds me a bit of albert einstein because he had a, a lover who was working for the ussr at a certain time and uh you know like you can't expect people to be great at everything but as far as all those uh developments that tesla had in his head i would definitely love to find out more about uh why exactly you think that they were split off and what exactly happened there Right. So you asked me a, a very specific question, which is an ontological and epistemological question and about the nature of personhood and individuality. And so what I suspect is the case, you know, he had he had some. I don't know if training is the right word, but he had experience with the occult and he was very interested in the occult from a relatively young age. He was very good friends with Swami Vivekananda, who wrote a series of studies on various forms of yoga, including, you know, Raja Yoga. And he was very interested in Sanskrit philosophical. Early on. Oh, by the way, Jason, uh, when you talk, sometimes there is a glitch that happens when uh, the connection abruptly ends for several seconds. So oh. I just want to uh, make sure maybe there's some Wi-Fi signal you can switch to make sure that the connection is slightly better. Uh, I mean, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens. I'm, I'm, a on, lot. I'm on. Everybody bear with us here.
So uh, Jason's figuring this out, and be sure to smash the like button and subscribe button while we're figuring all of this out. And also be sure to go to patreon.com slash break the rules, become a patron today. We are going to have more of these amazing conversations for you, bringing all the various people together online and offline so they can talk and learn more about each other. And don't worry, once Jason is back, we are definitely going to be getting into just Lane Maxwell and all the various things that are uh, going on with her and uh, the lost city of Atlantis. So don't worry about that. We're going to get it all figured out. Have me back now. I have you back. The graphic quality is not that good yet, but the sound is there. You don't seem to be lagging. So, uh, is it a different connection that you? I have got? a five G. Con- I have a five G connection going. I went to check it and I dropped out entirely. I don't know what. Maybe it's the weather. It's a gray, rainy day here, and sometimes the weather, for some reason, I don't understand, interferes with yeah. Wi Fi. Yeah, I mean, right now your graphics are not as good as they were in the past, as as they were before you went away. So I don't know if anything changed there, but it's stable. So as long as it's stable, I think that is the uh, most important thing. If the graphics, want- ca- yeah. Okay. Do, do you want me to come out, go out, and come back in again and see what happens? No, I think it's actually getting a little bit better. Like as we're talking, I'm noticing your face is getting clear. So anyway, we're gonna let's uh, let's continue. I think this is good. Okay. So so. Tesla was, I think, to some extent, um, practiced in the occult. And he was also very interested in Buddhism. And I mean, to the extent that he would send copies of a book called Gospel of the Buddha to all of his friends, his closest friends in the mail, you know, like with the note. Of the teaching of Gautama Buddha. And if you look at you know, the Buddhist conception of, of uh, the self, or rather of no self, anatman, anatta in Pali or anatman in Sanskrit, you see how Gotama is trying to give an account of how we could sustain a sense of self-consciousness and um, personal, a, a seeming awareness of our personal identity without there being any indestructible substance that that would be a property of. So, you know, the Hindus have this conception of the Atman, of an indestructible self that goes from, you know, one incarnation to another and uh, that ultimately will be reunified with Brahman, uh, with God, the the absolute, the infinite. And Gautama Buddha both deconstructs the the, uh, Brahman conception. He both deconstructs God. And in a strict sense, Gautama Buddha is an atheist, um, and he also deconstructs this idea of an indestructible and absolute self. Instead, the image that Buddha presents us with is something that I think we can understand very well in terms of software coding. That, you know, there are, there are discernible and um, separable lines warp and weft of a tapestry of code that constitutes our sense of personhood and also in terms of the interpretation of our experience through our memories of the past. I mean, those are all properties that you could see in a software program, especially today as we're developing artificial intelligence and as AI is sort of supporting uh, at least non-player characters in in a gaming atmosphere, right? So you can you know you can see how it's possible to modify the code of a simulated person in the context of a computer program, and it's also possible to take that code and replicate it any number of times uh, and run uh, the simulation of that quote person unquote run that simulation forward in any number of different ways in separate programs, right? So the person has the, all of the versions have the same backstory. They have the same memories. But from the, that moment onward that you decide to run one or another of them in a simulated scenario, they wind up having branching experiences, right? Divergent experiences, which then over time may change their sense of personhood. And so what used to be a single person will then diverge through enough, you know, differentiating experiences 
into a multiplicity of people uh, distinguishable by by variances in their personality and their behavioral pro beha behavioral profile and so forth, right? So I think that this is how the human quote unquote soul works, and that uh, it's possible. And there are there are empirical cases of this. Uh, there's there's this uh, there's this case of these twins, Terry and Linda Jameson, who happen to also be psychic. They're mediums, Terry and Linda Jameson. And they believe that they're the same person who's been reincarnated now into two different bodies. Okay, so um, I think the soul can come apart. The warp and weft of a soul can come apart. It can be copied like software. Uh, and that in that way, you can wind up having spiritual doppelgangers, albeit in different bodies. Um, and I think that this is something that Tesla did to himself artificially. Okay. And the devil's in the details. I mean, read the book. I, I, you know, I evoke in a much more compelling way, the kind of duress that I think he was under and why it is that he chose to do this. I, I believe that he fragmented himself, his mind rather, so that the information that was locked away in it could not be telepathically accessed. And so, so it's possible that more than one person bears the legacy of the memories of that man or parts of his knowledge. There is, a, well, first a quick aside. I was looking through my dream diary and I had a dream in 2017 where there was this girl I had a crush on back in acting school and we were together, but then I saw these twins and it says over here, he was around twins who he was working for who were dual beings of the same mold in the previous incarnation, but of one person. So that definitely relates to what you were talking about just now, but then there's still the question of the I, the person who is the experiencer of one's reality, which one would the I go to? No, no, it's a function. It's See, this is a... This, the sense of self-consciousness is a function of the software. It, it, uh, it arises, first of all, like when you're put into a co induced coma during uh, induced coma, when you're put into induced unconsciousness during dental surgery or something, you lose your sense of I there as well, right? Yes. So the I is a generative function that follows from a certain state of information, from a certain state of information processing. If the information doesn't process in a certain way, you don't have a sense of I. And even, you know, uh, in certain, where you're not unconscious, but you're in a deeply subconscious state, like certain dream states, dream states where you don't have lucidity at all, it's arguable whether that self-conscious I is there in the same way in those states either, right? So this, this sense of, you know, ego cogito ergo sum, as Descartes put it, it's a transitory ephemeral experience that's uh, contingent, dependent on certain conditions of information processing. And it's a generative function of information processing, which is, I think, what uh, engineers in artificial intelligence would tell you today, except that these engineers are stuck in a very mechanistic uh, materialist paradigm. And, and, uh, which I think that they're going to need to break through if they want to really uh, be able to succeed in building a strong artificial intelligence, because that strong artificial or general artificial general intelligence, AGI, will also have telepathy and psychokinesis and so forth, because these are properties of any mind that's self-conscious. Actually, it's a property of minds that aren't even self-conscious. Animals have telepathy and clairvoyance. Yeah, and Rupert Sheldrake. Yeah. Down the ladder. No, definitely. I know what you're uh, talking about there. The only, I wouldn't say issue, but the only thing that takes me a little bit of away from that idea is I was reading this book called Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, where they pointed out that when you do any kind of uh, exercise having to do with meditation and you try to recollect everything that's going on around you, you can only really concentrate on one thing at a time. So their exercises would involve uh, noting, like looking around the room, having different experiences and noting every time you experience certain sensation, but you're not able to experience more than one sensation at a time. So if we're talking about the sense of uh, one's experience 
and maybe I'm not understanding you here, but if I have an experience, I'm only able to have that one experience and not really have the experience you are having right now or anybody else is having right now. So that's why the idea of where exactly does this experiencer go to if the soul is split, as it were, that's the only reason why I'm having a hard time digesting each, this. Each, okay, each of the copies would have its own sense of self-consciousness. Because the code in each case is complex enough that code is complex enough that it will generate a sense of self-consciousness in each of the copies. Sure. I mean, you could, I understand what you're saying, but you could definitely understand how being somebody who is self-conscious of the only thing I am aware of as my existence right now, how imagining that to be the case is hard. But I can understand intellectually what you are saying. It's just that being in this body, it's hard to imagine that being uh, split up. But uh, I do want to get to the other part about reincarnation where I, I am you? there. I am here. I can hear you and you are there as well. A moment again. Oh, um, no problem. Here's the thing is that you're not being... Oh, I lost you one more time, Jason. So, I know, maybe there is a way for you to switch to Wi-Fi. I don't know if I'm able to hear you right now, but if the 5G is really bad, which apparently it is, is there any way that you can switch to a Wi-Fi signal, like a local Wi-Fi signal, and that way we'd be able to talk without the interruptions going on? Um, I can... The only other thing that I can do is switch to my uh, cell phone Wi-Fi hotspot, which I suspect would be worse. Mm. Okay, well, in that case, let's not risk it. It's not right. that bad. Sometimes it goes in and out. But anyway, uh, to get back to what so, we were talking what about. I was, what yes. I was saying was that you're not being split, okay? This sense that you have that you are you, ego, that is a function being generated by the code that makes up your personality and stores your memories. Once that code is copied, Lev version B and Lev version C are each having an experience of ego cogito, of I am here, I am myself. You don't have access to their experience of that. And they don't have access to yours unless you two have some kind of a intense telepathic uh, you know, engagement with each other, right? But short of that, once the moment, you know, once at the moment that the code is split, you each have a discrete sense of personhood. The only thing is that if you had an interview with one another, sat down and had a chat with one another, you would find out that you have not only do you, I mean, if it was in a cloned body, then obviously you'd look like the person. But let's say the code was put in a, in a body that looked completely different. If you sat down and had a conversation with this person, you'd see you have all the same memories as this person, right? Up to the moment when the code was copied. Other than that, you each have a completely distinct sense of personhood. Now, you, may, you might wind up behaving. You probably have all of the same quirks and all of the same behavioral propensities as one another as well, because those are all conditioned by your memories of your experiences, including like unconscious behavioral memory. So if somebody were to, for example, not talking about reincarnation, but take a copy of me as I am right now, put it into a robot and then have that robot talk back to me, I would still be experiencing life in this particular body. So that's what still, and I don't want to dwell too much on this because I feel like this is a very uh, multi-level leveled conversation that could be had here. I would love to have another one specifically on this, maybe bring on Sticks, Hex, and Hammer 666 or other potential guests to talk about it because it is a very, very deep subject. But uh, in relation to this, what I want to get into is the idea of the hive mind. So another thing that I mentioned uh, before was the, let's say... Um, the mutual understanding that some people believe would happen if minds were connected, whether we're talking about through Neuralink or the development of uh, psychic powers, you kind of rebel against this in your book when you are talking about, uh, for example, in Edgar Casey's vision of Atlantis, how you had these people who were following, you know, the law of the one and how this sense of interconnectedness ended up making them very subservient. 
So that is one way to look at it. But another way could be, let's say, with possible wars that would uh, potentially happen with the spectral revolution where I have access to whatever you're thinking and you have access to what I'm thinking. If there was this future scenario where the members of the uh, United Nations were to instigate a fight against you, wouldn't there be a certain level that would be reached where if they had certain people that were able to go into your mind and you into their mind, you would be able to actually work out some kind of agreement and see, like, why are we fighting? <laughs> you know, like, at a certain point, I'm imagining it could be a scenario of, uh, like, I like to uh, imagine a, um, a kid that's playing in the bathtub with, like, two battleships. And each arm thinks it's like the enemy of the other one, and they they realize, oh, what are we fighting for? Like we're, and I know that this goes into the territory of we're the same thing, man. And I know that you are against that. But barring that kind of reality, even the idea of thinking whatever the other person is thinking, there could be some room for a potential, uh, uh, a potential truce, a potential partnership in that case. I don't know. That's just my take. Curious what you think. I don't agree at all. Uh, and I think that when you look back at uh, mostly Steiner's account of Atlantis, but I think it's there, there are hints of it in Casey as well. Uh, but certainly Steiner believes that an all out psychic war took place between these two factions that far from coming to understand one another through telepathy, they actually turned their minds on one another and they used psi ability as another form of warfare in the name of. Uh, you know, defending their deeply divergent principles and, and worldviews. Uh, so, no, I think that um, the, the basic worldview of these children of the law of one, as, um, as Casey calls them, uh, and the worldview of uh, the sons of Belial, as Casey calls them, um, the, the divergence is so deep and so fundamental that... It's a question of principle and worldview, and, and I don't think that it will be resolved it's simply because, you know, people on both sides of the conflict have telepathy. Uh, no, I, I mean, you know, to presume that that will be the case is to presume, as you as you admitted yourself, that there's some final objective truth of the way things are and that by reaching into each other's minds, we can come to some collective understanding of what that is. And I fundamentally reject that idea that there is any objective truth or reality, capital R, or anything like that. Uh, I don't think that that's what life is about. I think life is about creation and discovery and innovation. And there are people who align themselves with that life force. And there are people who want to constrain it, who are, you know, technophilic, who are afraid of the new, afraid of change, and want to basically establish an entirely stable and static society. And they justify that by claiming that that form of society is the microcosm of some macrocosm, of some cosmic order, which then is being instantiated in their putatively perfect social order. That was the view of the... the uh, the establishment on earth that was governed by the Olympian gods, or if you want to put it in a Hindu context, by the devas. Uh, the establishment, the, the hierarchy, hierosarchy, that's where the word hierarchy comes from. Hierosarchy mm -hmm. meaning divine order. And the archons as well, or is that a different word? Well, the archons are the Olympians. They're, yeah. you know, to put it in a Gnostic language, what I'm calling the Olympians in, in Greek pagan language, or the devas in Sanskrit are the archons. And so these archons believe that they are the be all and end all, and they are the capstone of a pyramidal hierarchy, a hierosarchy, a holy order um, that you know masses of people ought to be subjected to for their own good, supposedly, uh, and that this is the most perfect form of society that could ever be achieved. And if anything, over time, it can only deteriorate and degenerate you know, over these vast, declining cycles of ages until finally the gods have to intervene and start the whole cycle again with a new golden age, right? That's the traditionalist view. That's the view of the establishment that Atlantis rebelled against in Atlantis or in the civilization of Noah, to put it in a biblical context, we see the first rebellion against this order. And, uh, you know, it, it ends badly. It ends with the destruction of Atlantean civilization by the Olympians. And I know that you are 
more on the side of the uh, Belal organization. If you were to be devil's or rather angel's advocate here for a second, when you are given a lot of freedom to do creative things, to rebel against the establishment, we've also seen, for example, various groups that were rebelling against the establishment uh, in the United States, in a revolution, you know, pre-Soviet Russia. Things could go in a better direction or things go in a bad direction, which is why I can never just uh, say that whatever revolutionary act happens, it's going to be for the better. Could there be instances of these rebel Atlanteans creating things that actually do end up causing a lot of harm to which the Olympians may be despite their, you know, bad nature, you know, with somebody like Zeus committing all the horrible things that he committed, despite that, them being in a way justified as the lesser evil? No. Uh, so let me give you my lengthy answer to that. Okay. I have this... Con I I've developed seven original concepts as part of my philosophical project, and I lay them out with crystal clarity in the first chapter of Promethean Pirate. Chapter one of Promethean Pirate is the clearest, most cohesive, crystalline exposition of my entire philosophical project in a very condensed form. So, I mean, it doesn't substitute for reading all my books, but it's a great key. And I make references to, you know, where I develop these concepts in all my other texts, right? And one of these concepts is being bound for freedom. And many of these concepts, or most of these seven concepts I developed, are polyvalent. They have more than one dimension of meaning. So this is true of being bound for freedom as well. And being bound for freedom on one level is an ontological, epistemological concept, which has to do with being qua existence, being bound up or structured in a way that allows for free will. Um, another aspect of being bound for freedom is the teleology of history, being or existence bound or headed for the achievement or actualization of freedom. So the idea very much coming out of Hegel and Marx that history has a direction, right? And then finally, the third dimension of being bound for freedom is the sense in which Prometheus is bound, Prometheus bound, that the rebel in the name of freedom, the fighter for liberation, is one who is willing to be bound like in chains, or worse, for the sake of freedom, okay? So now building off of that, to answer your question, I discuss how part of the teleological dimension of this concept of being bound for freedom is the history of all revolutions, of all revolutions in the name of freedom. And you're absolutely right that some of them end horribly, okay? I mean, you know, uh, well, well, which ones of them don't involve massive bloodshed and terror and violence, right? I mean, the American Revolution was relatively successful by comparison to the French and the Russian revolutions. But look, we fought a revolutionary war against the British. We fought a war. It wasn't just a revolution. We fought a war to defend our independence from them. And we set up a country based on that initial constitution of the United States that wound up tearing itself apart in a civil war a few decades later, right? So, okay, so, and then you look at the French Revolution, the cult of reason, what went on with the cult of reason, then the reaction in the reign of terror. You look at how quickly, you know, the Soviet Revolution devolved into tyranny, okay? And a conservative, a person with a traditionalist mindset or, or a liberal who's inclined toward pacifism might look at that and say, well, look, this is horrid. Like maybe there's something wrong with this very idea of revolution. I say absolutely not. It's growing pains. It is the, it is the caterpillar transforming into the butterfly. It's a violent transformation. And all, the violence and the bloodshed of all of these revolutions in the name of freedom and the failure of these attempts to, to set up systems that revolutionize society, all of it is justified by the will toward greater freedom and creating conditions of possibility to maximize human creativity and industriousness. That was the aim of Marx. Marx was a freedom fighter. Whatever problems there are with his thinking, I have many problems with his thinking. Mm -hmm. But if anyone who sincerely reads Marx, you know, with, with, with uh, you know, in a genuine 
manner, okay? And, and with, a, with a, a will to actually understand what the man was saying, all right, we'll come to the conclusion that he was as much of a freedom fighter as Thomas Paine in the American Revolution. In his own way, in his own time, Marx was a similar person as, uh, you know, to, 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 to Paine. They were both Promethean characters. And the same could be said of the men who led the cult of reason during the French Revolution. Again, they, they suffered from a certain myopic materialism and, and reductive mechanistic outlook. But at heart, they were Prometheans and they were helping us to leave the uh, feudal agrarian slave state of the medieval epoch behind us and helping to create universal education and you know all of these advances in technology and industry that have uh, empowered the human individual. So yeah, revolutions are bloody, they're costly, the systems they create are not perfect, nothing is perfect, nothing will ever be perfect. But progress is defensible and justified, in my view. As far as the people you pick to be on your sidelines for the progress, I would much rather take George Washington or Thomas Jefferson than take somebody like Leon Trotsky or uh, Lenin, for that matter. So the reason why I'm saying this is that you do, I think, get to pick your poison as far as which people you want to be on board with in changing things. Because I think certain people, they have a very uh, ends justify the means intent where they don't mind doing things that they could possibly avoid. If we look at, for example, Japan's growth after the Meiji Restoration versus Russia's growth, I bet Russia would be able to have grown just as much without all the needless bloodshed, without all the carnage and uh, uh, just absolute dehumanization. That's, that's not the point. That's not the point, though. You see, yeah, growth in the sense of had the czarist system continued, would there have been a higher economic standard? Would there perhaps have been more consistent industrial productivity? Perhaps, perhaps there would have been. But without the catharsis of the destruction of the idea of monarchy and hereditary aristocracy, sometimes bloodshed and violent chaos are necessary and justified for the sake of the destruction of an idea that has tyrannized over the minds of men. And that deconstruction is necessary to free up potentiality for much more long-term growth. So do I think that in the years around 1917 to like 1927 or something like that, without that revolution, Russia would have been more economically productive? Undoubtedly so. Do I think that czarist Russia with the Orthodox Church having the power that it did, with the aristocracy having the power that it did, do I think that that system would have produced the Soviet space superpower of the 1950s? Absolutely not. But what, if, but what if there was a third choice which could have happened, which was the very uh, first revolution of 1917, the one before the Bolsheviks came in? When I look at something like that, even though that didn't happen, I do see potential for things of that nature to occur, where there is going to be strife, there is going to be bloodshed, but at the same time, it does not go to such an extent as it did in the USSR. So that's really the only thing that I'm saying here. I don't oh, think I we agree. disagree. Listen, I agree with you. Revolutions always can go wrong and they can get hijacked. I mean, look, I, I've, I've studied in depth one of the best case studies of this, which is the Iranian Revolution of 1979 was a revolution that was totally hijacked by a bunch of ayatollahs, right? I mean, that, that revolution was supposed to be a revolution in the name of, you know, representative government and liberty and freedom of the press and freedom of, you know, and it turned out to be, uh, you know, a, a, a chaos that empowered a backwards medieval Muslim theocracy. And so, yes, revolutions can be hijacked and derailed. That is not an argument in favor of abandoning revolutionary uh, activity and the aspiration for radical social change. Now, the aspiration for radical social change as far as becoming a Promethean pirate and the connection that that has to uh, just Lane Maxwell and Atlantis, I really want to get into that uh, very soon. But before that, one last thing regarding the idea of uh, freedom. When you have something like 2 plus 2 equals 4, if we are totally free, then we still would not be able to change certain axioms like that, at least not that I'm aware of. So where would you say the limits are here when it comes to freedom? 
two plus two equals four. Look, mathematics is tautological. Mathematical analysis is a, it's a schematization tool. The, if you look back at Prometheus and Atlas, this has been my argument from the beginning of my philosophical project. It's, it's an incredibly important aspect of my project is this argument that abstract schemas like mathematics and the way that it's used in physics are tools for the sake of producing and doing things. Okay. They are not uh, a notation for describing objective features of reality, capital R. If you start to be possessed by the delusion that mathematics describes objective reality, you wind up believing in things like an infinity of identical universes, right? So there's this idea that there's only a finite number of particles in our universe, but there's infinite space. And so if there are other universes besides ours outside the edge of our universe, at a certain point, the finite configuration of particles in our universe will repeat, right? In universe number, I don't know, whatever, a quadrillion, right? Yeah. Okay. So, and before you get to that one, there's a universe where there's Earth, but the dinosaurs never were killed. There's a universe where the Nazis won the Second World War, etc. And eventually, at some point out into infinite space, there's a universe that's totally identical to ours. And there are infinitely many of those of those universes that are identical to ours. Even if you don't admit the infinity of space in that way, let's, let's say you have this conception where space is finite and there's only our universe, right? And it's closed in on itself and there's nothing outside the edge of it. Still, when you get possessed by the objectivity of mathematical description, you start to think that there's an infinity of time such that the finite configuration of particles in this universe will be repeated at brilliant universes into the future, right? So once this universe faces some kind of a collapse or destruction, there's this oscillating universe theory, right? The universe gets to a certain point of expansion and then big crunch begins and it collapses and it expands again. And there's any number of these collapses and expansions of the universe. That's one cosmology. And if you're possessed by mathematics being objective, the idea that mathematics objectively describes reality, you'll, you'll create this equation where the finitude of particles in the universe and, and the, the only finite number of their potential configurations set against the background of infinite time means that at some point in the future, this conversation we're having is going to repeat itself exactly in, in people who are doubles of ourselves. And that will happen infinitely no, many number of times going forward into, quote, the future, unquote. Of course, that's an absurd conception of mm. futurity or, or the and future. And it becomes a troublesome for something like the idea of free will. Well, it, when... it, well it's a total negation of free will. Yes, okay? exactly. Uh, it's a total negation of free will. Or, or another outcome of this thinking mathematics is objective is people who try to resolve, we've talked about this before, people who try to resolve quantum superposition, the problem of quantum superposition by saying that the superposition is resolved in any number of ways. It actually is resolved in any number of ways, but in hidden and parallel universes, in an infinity of branching mm. universes. And to my mind, these are all diseased ways of thinking that come from the delusion that mathematics objectively describes reality, capital R. These are me human mental projections, abstractions, that have no practical significance, that have no utility, and not only do they not have practical significance or utility, if you invest in them, if you ascribe reality to them, you're actually going to be left with a negation of free will and a debilitation of your motivation to do anything of practical significance. So on balance, you know, thinking the way that, that let's say, William James thinks in his writings, these are not useful ideas. Now, in terms of uh, what you were talking about in relation to practicality something like the idea of form following function we were just talking about architecture before uh, the stream started as well and you were talking about the uh beautiful uh what was that uh, uh hold on what is wrong with me the uh herald square train station oh um uh no penn station penn, penn station. station yes thank you so we were talking about how beautiful penn station was 
And I think that there is something, even though human beings, as you mentioned, are pure becoming, and I agree with you there, there is still a sense that I think we have for harmony, for beauty. And it could show in all kinds of ways. We were talking before about how uh, we both are big fans of Art Nouveau. And even if Art Nouveau stretches beyond what is considered to be, you know, very strict classical ways of doing things, it still maintains that balance and harmony. You were writing about feng shui being something that was possibly used by the Atlanteans, and you're also ascribing a very authoritarian nature to the Atlanteans. But if we completely go the other way around, it seems like we long for this harmony, and harmony plays a role here, as does possibly the whole hermetic as above, so below principle. This is something that just seems to be very close to us. So if that is the case, then we are still under, you could say, some kind of law, something where I guess people would call that, and I know you disagree about things like uh, karma, for instance, but it seems like there is a there is a tendency some of us have to want there to be a certain balance and a certain harmony. So any thoughts on that before we... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, I don't think it has anything to do with karma. and I, I, It doesn't have anything to do with karma as far as i can tell but order yeah sure look creation requires a certain tension and modulation between order and chaos that's every creative act is a modification of order by chaos and a structuring of of chaos by order and so you need or if there's no order, there's no creation, right? It's yes. a question of how much spontaneity is introduced into order by the uh, by the eruption of chaos, by the you know by allowing chaos to break through an ossified structure and to revitalize uh, you know that structure to uh, to reintroduce dynamism so that there can be novel. Um, composition which can affect the mind, which can structure consciousness, which can, in Heidegger's terms, set the atmosphere of a world of meaning for a people, is going to involve a balance between and a tension between order and chaos. So yeah, no, no doubt. I'm not like, you know, advocating for total chaos or something like that. No, I, I'm just trying to resist um, a very fixed idea of perfect order, a putatively perfect and complete order, which these Olympians or devas, whatever you want to call them, believe that they had arrived at and which they would like to reimpose on the world. I can just imagine, though, that what you said right now, this uh, going back and forth, almost like a breathing in and breathing out, like this undulation of something that becomes very stiltifying, very restricting, that being broken down, it just seems like the act of creating the order and the order breaking down and being created again, that there is something to that that people may perhaps think is a kind of law, a kind of harmony that occurs. And the reason why I mentioned karma, I would imagine if there was a case of some alien overlord deciding to impose you know, some kind of very draconian laws upon his people, do unspeakable, unspeakable horrible things, I'd imagine at a certain point that get ba gets balanced out. But again, that could just be my naivety, but I'm curious, like, what you well, think I'll of think that? I'll why yeah. I think it's naive, because you're imagining a tyranny, a tyranny, a, an exercise of brute force, where you have a relatively aware and individuated population which is being dictated to from above by some tyrant. That's not the danger. You're right. Any system like that will collapse. Like, for example, in, in Iran right now, we're seeing the collapse sure. of such a system, right? I mean, there you have an incredibly sophisticated civil society with incredibly, you know, individuated, largely forward thinking people. And then some bunch of retarded backward dictators are trying to force them to stay in a certain mold. Well, that, that's going to collapse. That's not sustainable. And we've seen all these examples of that throughout history. That's not the real danger. The danger is an organic state. The danger is when you have a population that, as you were suggesting earlier, has kind of a collective mindset. They don't feel like they're being dictated to because they are part of a more collective sense of identity, almost a hive mind. And so their leadership 
is just seen as like the queen bee in a hive, giving direction and guidance, right, to the collective. Uh, that's the danger. And the, the society that the rebel Atlanteans attempted to break apart and overthrow to get out from under, the society they, tried, they rebelled against was that kind of a collectivistic, hive mind, almost hive-minded society where people were not sufficiently individuated to realize that their developmental potential was being constrained, okay? So the, the, the image of like, you know, the serpent offering the fruit of knowledge in the garden yes. of Eden, Prometheus stealing the fire, you know, and gifting it to mankind. So that's the issue is that, and this is very clear in, in both Edgar Cayce and especially Rudolf Steiner, when Steiner described, but see, he has a positive view of it, that, you know, there was this harmony and collective consciousness of people initiated into the mysteries by these guru leaders that they had and so forth. And um, I think that that system was retarding human development for an excessively long time, like tens and tens of thousands of years. Uh, and that it's a good thing we were able to break out from under it. Uh, and, and I have no intention of, you know, sitting here and, and uh, letting us be forced back in, into that type of social order. No, I don't want to dwell too much on the uh, karmic question because it is something that I want to think about a little bit more and then get back to you again about it. One thing that I would want to mention here, though, is if you were one of those Atlantean uh, judges, one of those uh, Olympians, and let's say you acted that certain kind of way towards the people who are quote-unquote beneath you, do you think that there is something in existence that would make you answer for the way that you behaved and i'm not talking about a god i'm talking about something like uh there's a action there's going to be an, a reaction to a, any kind of action type of deal if you act a certain way would it balance out later on in your next lives no uh, no it wouldn't okay I, I really strongly counsel people to read, again, Ian Stevenson's Studies of Reincarnation, where you see this on a really micro scale in terms of like the lives of murderers, the, the you know, children who remember having been murderers in their past lives or who, having, who remember having been the victim of a, uh, of, of a murderer or something like that and how these social dynamics play out. In some cases, the child is even able to identify who it was that was the assailant in the previous lifetime, and that person is still alive. And there's all these dramas that play out in a small town where something like that will happen, especially if it's in a country where there is a belief in reincarnation, like in India, right? And anyway, why am I saying that? It gives you a very small-scale example, kind of like a microcosm, of... Um, the way in which the con conventional conception of karma is not applicable. There appears to be no uh, cosmic or divine justice that, you know, uh, basically makes someone have to come to terms with what it is that they did, you know, in a previous lifetime or how they behave toward others. Uh, there doesn't appear to be anything like that. The thing that I think there is, which we know from human psychology, is the way in which your subconscious comes back to haunt you, right? I mean, people can be tortured by their own subconscious. And this doesn't necessarily have to do with, you know, uh, you know, the dynamics of one's behavior across lifetimes. It can be even in a single lifetime. If a person behaves in an extremely um, dictatorial even sadistic manner towards others, right? Well, they're probably some kind of a narcissistic psychopath. And, you know, it happens in human psychology that these kinds of narcissists experience a collapse at a certain point, right? Their world caves in on them. Their f the false sense of self that they're trying to sustain uh, comes apart and, and implodes, Right. And they become these collapsed narcissists. Right. And that's a kind of uh, 
That's kind of re retribution in a certain sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it retribution. It's just like, it's the dynamics of how... There are people who behave in an incredibly brutal and sadistic, manipulative manner their entire lives, and they get away scot-free having done so. And some of them are murderers, and some of them are running our governments. Well, then the question, and again, I want to I want to get to the Atlantean, uh, just Lane Maxwell really soon. But just to kind of put an end to this particular very fascinating conversation, when it comes to the in-between place that people are in, I know that the Buddha rejected there being any Brahma, any gods of that sort. But we were also talking about before the various experiences that people have had in the quote unquote astral realm. And I've always been very curious about what are these various realms that people can get into that are beyond wherever we happen to be right now, the experiences that people have there, and whether that also relates to certain experiences that people will have in between their incarnations, and what exactly has been the evidence for that. Yeah, well, there's a lot of evidence for that. So did you have any specific things in mind? Sure. I think one thing that I would like to focus on is the various religions experiencing their kind of heaven or their kind of hell, but then what happens to the people who would reject those religions and would be like, wait, I'm not falling for this. What's going on here? You know, I know too much. You know, like those two different okay. scenarios. Okay, great question. Great question. I'm going to give you an utterly horrifying answer. <laughs> uh, so I refer people to my book, Closer Encounters, uh, particularly the ending of uh, chapter six in Closer Encounters. It's a seven chapter book. And in the last section of chapter six, the last, I, the last maybe second to last and the last uh, section, penultimate section and the final uh, section of that chapter six in that book, Closer Encounters. I talk about near-death experiences, the Bardo state, uh, apparitions of heaven and hell, right? and <clears throat> their connection to alien abductions and what people have experienced in the course of alien abductions. There's a guy, Kenneth Ring, who did a comparative study of alien abductions and near-death experiences and how many cases there are where in the course of alien abductions, people have interacted with dead people who they didn't know were dead, friends or family who had just died, where the individual being abducted wasn't aware that the person had died, hadn't been made aware of it yet by a phone call or mail or whatever. And yet in the abduction experience, they are shown the dead friend or relative, right? And are able to interact with them. And there's cases of alien abduction that are identi almost identical in their phenomenology to people dying and going to either heaven or hell, where like the greys or the aliens or whatever function basically as messengers of souls and you know, angels stealing souls away to one or another place. Ascended right? masters wearing purple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now you bring, bring, <laughs> bring ascended masters, the life review that people say they have during a near death experience. And then these masters who sit there and they, they help you evaluate the replay of your life and all that. There's a great study by PMH Atwater called Beyond the Light, which I recommend. And she points out in that book that. There's a tendency for researchers in the field of NDEs, near-death experiences, to only report the, heaven, the heavenly, heavenly experiences, where people go into the light and they see Jesus and they're taken up to heaven and, you know, maybe they meet their dead relatives. And then, okay, if they're successfully resuscitated in the emergency room, they come back and they report this experience, right? Well, there's a huge selection bias there. There are many people who experience hell. And there are many people who experience neither. They just experience weird shit. Like, okay, they don't have a particular belief in heaven or hell. And they experience just really disturbing things in this Bardo state uh, when, let's say, they flatlined on, on an operating table in an emergency room. And she goes through basically a phenomenology of these various experiences. And number one, number one, she noted that there's a correlation between somebody's belief system and the type of experience that they have after death. And number two, so, so like, for example, Hindus will see Hindu gods. Yes. And interact with Hindu gods and Christians will see Jesus and so forth. Right. 
And But here's the most interesting thing that she found. And this lines up perfectly with Kenneth Ring's research on the, on the intersection between NDEs and alien abductions, is that both Kenneth Ring and PMH Atwater in this book, Beyond the Light, show that there are, there are bungling bureaucrats on the other side. They sometimes take somebody by mistake to hell and they'll torture this person in hell, like they'll cut their various arms or legs off or whatever. And then they'll realize a, a message will come to the torturer saying, no, 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 you got the wrong guy. I told you it wasn't this guy. Send him back. We told you to go get such and such another guy. And then they reattach the person's limbs, right, that have been severed in this hellish environment. And the person who's resuscitated in the hospital will have strange marks, like, like, uh, like uh, healed scar marks where the limb was detached in this, you know, uh, uh, Bardo state experience that the person had, right? And they'll come back with the story about how they were mistakenly taken down into hell because there was a bureaucratic error among the managers of whatever this realm is, right? And the same thing happens with alien abductions that have a similar quality to near-death experiences. The wrong person is taken and then has to be returned. And the person who's enduring this horrific experience becomes quite aware that his captors are arguing over whether he was the one who was supposed to be taken and so on and so forth, okay? Now, it, it, it's, I know I, I'm fully aware that it sounds insane to some No, I'm, I'm with you. I know what's going on, yeah. The devil's in the details. First of all, there's a, sum, there's a, a very, um, a very uh, concise summary of this and synthesis and summary of it in that last section of chapter six in my Closer Encounters. But go back to the original sources, read Atwater's book and read Kenneth Ring's writings on this, his case studies of this. It's incredibly disturbing. What it suggests is that these archons have a management system in place using psychotronic technology and they can interfere in the process of our death and our rebirth. They manipulate us. And it's probably why so few people remember their past lives. We are made to forget our past lives because we're supposed to remain ignorant. We are being kept in a state of uh, enforced ignorance and uh, dissociation, deliberately induced dissociation. Uh, and so, so that we're more easily manipulable. Uh, and in Closer Encounters, I argue that, you know, again, the devil's in the details. This is going to sound like an outlandish claim on the face of it, but go read the, the various empirical studies that I, that I synthesize about the moon and why it's an artificial object. I believe the psychotronic technology that's being used to interfere with people between death and rebirth is located inside the moon. It's an artificial satellite that's largely hollow. In other words, there's a lot of empty space inside it. And there's some kind of vast machinery inside this thing that not only performs you know, uh, gravitational functions with respect to the Earth and its ecosystem, but also has psychotronic uh, components to it that are being used to interfere in the death and rebirth process. And this is something that, of all people, Gurdjieff, yeah, was I was just about to say, yes. Bizarre. And by the way, I had no knowledge of this until until after I had uh, done this empirical research, you know, involving NDEs, uh, this, uh, until I had studied, let's say, Kenneth Ring and, and PMH Atwater. It was brought to my attention by people who are in the Gurdjieff work that Gurdjieff had these bizarre ideas about how, like, our souls were food for the moon. And that you had to cultivate yourself so that you didn't wind up becoming food for the moon after death. And I think so. He was on to this. You know, he, he expressed it in his own limited way as he could in this, you know, relatively, uh, you know, um, you know, technologically uh, uh, simpler era that he was living in. But essentially, I, I believe he was uh, attempting to describe the psychotronic technology. There is another book that I want to introduce here, which talks very similarly about these kind of things. I'm going to give you the title in a bit. But what's interesting to me about this particular book is that it describes how people who work on remembering their uh, existence, work on being much more aware of what's going on, 
in a way and i know like the book differs from your view in that it does see like this objective you know oneness of the universe and all that uh, although the, it sees it separate from what it calls the law but anyway what it talks about is how when you uh remember yourself then the universe or god or whatever remembers you and those are the people that end up reincarnating the people who are too much like i know i am bob the plumber and that's the only thing that i know they're going to go into the zone of just doing whatever it is that they want to do or having whatever experiences they want to have for who knows how long you know it could be like hundreds or thousands of years until finally their ego is over it they've already had enough and at that point they just stop existing or they go into like the big hole or whatever but the people who do remember and want to keep growing they continue and again that may be very different from the conception that you have but the reason why i mention it is i think that if it is as you say like these petty bureaucrats are working up there in moon heaven then they are not as strong or as competent so that people who actually do end up working on themselves and do end up getting certain insights that they would be able to get to some other some other level but with that i want to let me let me yes sure sure. one important thing there um so so yeah they're certainly not omnipotent and and obviously you know first of all i'm against any form of fatalism but uh i'm all also fundamentally against this idea of resistance is futile. No, it's not futile at all. These people are very fallible. The very fact that they bungle things the way they do shows that they are very limited. They're they're limited in their capacities and we can resist them. Okay. But with respect to this book, I'll definitely take a look at it. However, I can tell you right now that I really deeply disagree because one of the most interesting things that comes across in Ian Stevenson's hundreds and hundreds of case studies of reincarnation is that it's mostly involving Bob and Mary Sue uh, and, and, you know, John the Carpenter. Uh, it, these people are totally unremarkable, the ones he studies. You know, I mean, it's a great thing about, like, um, Stevenson's research. N- not a single case is like someone who remembers having been Cleopatra or whatever. They're all the most, like, just ordinary, mundane, ordinary Joe people who had totally mundane lives, usually, as I said, in small towns, which is where he chose to carry out case studies. And they just remember these lives that they had, you know, and they're they're very particular personal experiences. So interesting. Well, maybe the threshold is lower for what we're talking about. And the author's name, by the way, is William Walter Atkinson. And the book is called The Arcane Teaching. I don't know if you're familiar with it. No, never heard of it. I'll it's a very it's a, I'll send you a copy. It's a very interesting. But anyway, uh, the only other thing that I can add to this uh, part of the conversation is when you do go into that state of awareness and remembrance you were talking about how certain meditation techniques that people do as well as certain psychotropic uh, drugs they take they actually have a certain effect on the brain as well as when divers would go too deep in the water which would give you that effect of oneness with the universe but that's just a pure physiological thing and nothing really is being done here would you contrast that from being able to assume much higher levels of, let's say, uh, powers or understanding or whatever in this uh, spectral revolution. Yeah, I would. I would do. I would do that. And I, and I would say that, I mean, again, this is one of the places where Gautama Buddha really got it right. I have a lot of respect for Gautama. Uh, there's a, there are very deep ways in which my ontology and epistemology align with his. I think that he drew some erroneous ethical conclusions from an ontology and epistemology that in a lot of ways we share in common. But one of the things that Buddha got, you know, brilliantly right um, here is that cultivating psychokinesis or telepathy or clairvoyance or any of these things, right, which they call siddhis in Mm. Sanskrit, does not give you the uh, does not give you the knowledge that there is oneness and that there's God or there's any kind of eternal or infinite being. No, uh, Gautama Buddha uh, makes a very compelling argument in his sermons that this Brahman idea or the, the Atman that's a microcosm of that macrocosm are mental projections, and those projections can be used to focus the mind enough in order to cultivate these cities, but people 
can cultivate these cities without that kind of mental focus. And having these cities does not correlate at all to a recognition of some kind of divine oneness. Uh, and, you know, Gautama himself talks about how in the wars between the devas and the asuras, the gods and the titans, both sides have these powers. And, you know, uh, they use them for all kinds of uh, unethical ends and in, in utter disregard for any putative divine harmony. But what it would also suggest to me, at least, is that having those abilities means that you can sidestep the bureaucrats in that particular part of the matrix. And the question is then, what exact kind of adventures could you have outside of whatever reality is it that we are used to right now? What exactly is the limit here? We should find out. We should find out. And one of the most interesting things that Ingo Swan says in his book, Penetration, Ingo Swan was uh, one of the founders of the remote viewing program, the CIA remote viewing program in the 1970s. And he wrote this great book, Penetration, on um, his clairvoyance of the moon and the people on the moon for the CIA. Or he actually, he in insinuated that it was some other military intelligence outfit that was even more deeply buried than, than the CIA, which took him away from his work at the CIA, took him to some clandestine facility, and he remote viewed the moon for them from there to corroborate photographic evidence they had had for cities on the dark side of the moon. In any case, one of the things that Ingo Swan says in that book, Penetration, is he says these overlords, which he saw them, he saw them up on the moon. They told him to get the hell out of there. By the way, I could tell you an interesting story about that too. And so they said, get the hell out of here. You don't belong here. And he said, one thing about them is they're terrified of our psychic abilities. They don't want us to have the same kind of psychic abilities that they do. And they're trying to deliberately debilitate us in the, in the you know, realm of psychic cultivation because it would, in a way, put us on an equal footing with them and you know, render us less, less uh, vulnerable to their machinations. Very interesting. There is definitely a lot to get into here, which I look forward to doing in the future conversation. But I do want to get back to what I think a lot of people have been uh, waiting for, which is uh, just Lane Maxwell and the Atlantis connection. So when I first read that, that was uh, very eye opening. And uh, I do seem to recall now all these things about her, uh, her particular uh, interests. Well, I don't even want to talk about it. Uh, I want you to talk about it. So Please let us know what exactly is this just Lane Maxwell Atlantis connection. And by the way, to all the people who are watching right now, don't forget to smash that subscribe button, smash that like button. The bell is extremely important. And also share this video with all of your friends and family. But anyway, Jason, go for it. Yeah, so um, I basically indicate how horrendously, I mean, big surprise, how horrendously biased and uh, just warped the media coverage of this story has been, largely through censorship, largely through omission of incredibly relevant information about just what kind of operation this woman was involved with or involved in. And um, I, I indicate all kinds of ways in which Ghislaine Maxwell was fascinated by Atlantis and intent on recovering knowledge of that civilization. And when I say recovering knowledge, I mean, not just like, I mean, you know, she was an expert diver. So uh, her and Jeffrey Epstein had this submarine called Atlantis, the Atlantis submarine. And not only would she be diving on Atlantean ruins, in the Caribbean and Bahamas region, uh, ruins in an area where Edgar Casey claimed that Atlantis was located, right? So I think not only was she interested in excavating the civilization, um, I also believe that the reason that uh, people, scientists specializing in things like quantum gravity and gene splicing were being taken down in the Atlantis submarine uh, is because she was also interested in reconstructing the knowledge of that civilization. And it's an interest that I think she, she in part, uh, well, let's just say, I think it was in part catalyzed by her 
fascination with Jacques Cousteau, um, whose hidden life quest was actually the rediscovery of Atlantis. Cousteau's concern with ocean preservation, which is something that Ghislaine Maxwell, you know, uh, really devoted herself to later with her Terramar project in the in the 2010s, right? Um, Cousteau's concern with ocean preservation was largely a cover and an excuse for, uh, you know, submarine explorations really aimed at rediscovering Atlantis. And his son inherited that project from him and uh, died a very untimely death in a plane crash. And um, there have been suggestions uh, from some of the witnesses that testified in the trial that at one point, Ghislaine Maxwell had a relationship with Jacques Cousteau's granddaughter, Alexandra Cousteau. So anyway, I, I believe that she was part of a network of people who were attempting to excavate Atlantis and reconstruct its knowledge, uh, particularly the knowledge of the rebel faction in Atlantis. And uh, that you can see this in all kinds of ways. I mean, including, you know, the ground plan of the garden in uh, the Zorro Ranch, uh, you know, that, that Epstein had. It's in the concentric uh, ring pattern that Plato described as the ground plan of the city of Atlantis. Um, and uh, or the temple, ahead. the one of uh, that people confused to be like the temple of Moloch, you know, with the owl, which was actually a parrot, I think, like two parrots that were there. Uh, there was a statue of Poseidon mm. and a statue of Atlas. So yes. it was an Atlantean temple that Epstein had on one end of his uh, island on uh, Little St. James. It still seems a little bit weird to me because the temple itself, when you look at it up close, it looks a little bit tacky in my opinion. The way that it's painted, the way that it's done, and what exactly does a temple like that accomplish at the end of the day? You're just attracting undue attention to whatever it is that you're doing. So why do you think such a structure was uh, put in there in the first place? And when people found it, they found that it was empty inside, like there wasn't really anything going on. So well, what... it had been emptied by the time people were allowed true, to look. True. I mean, yeah, okay. they had to do their heads up, right? I mean, Jeffrey Epstein was arrested for the first time. Yeah. What was it, 2008 or something like that? By the way, okay, let me, this is an important thing that I yeah. will mention, right? Um. How many times was, was Epstein like arrested, interviewed, and then let go? And, you know, in these instances uh, in, in the 2000s where they, they uh, interdicted him uh, and uh, there, there might have, one might have expected some legal process to unfold, the authorities were basically told by the CIA, let this guy go. He's one of our assets, right? So Epstein was not just an intelligence agent. He was a double agent. Uh, he was working for multiple intelligence agencies. Ghislaine Maxwell's father is the one who gave Jeffrey Epstein his job as an intelligence agent. Uh, Robert Maxwell, Ghislaine's father, was a triple agent. He, first of all, he was a war hero, okay? He was a Jew from Ukraine whose family was killed in the Holocaust. And he obviously had an ax to grind against the Nazis. And evidently, he was an incredibly competent, capable person because he learned like five languages. And he was hired first by British intelligence. Uh, he was in the French resistance for a while. Then he was hired by British intelligence. And then at the, after the Second World War, and by the way, Robert Maxwell was an adopted name. It was an assumed name. It was not his actual name. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was, it was an intelligence operation. In, in any case, he was hired by British intelligence during the war from out of the French resistance. And then after World War II, he starts working with the KGB to spy on the British. He's spying on the British for the KGB and spying on the Russians for British intelligence. And then, of course, he's Jewish. So once the state of Israel becomes strong and Mossad is set up, well, he goes to work for Mossad as well. And he's spying for Mossad both on the British and on the Soviets, right? He was a super spy. And, and this whole business about like how his, his companies were insolvent, right? It's, it's all bullshit because his companies were never solvent. The guy was getting money from intelligence agencies to run journalistic enterprises that would be used to blackmail people for the sake of intelligence operations. So once intelligence agencies stopped paying him, why did they stop paying? When did Robert Maxwell wind up dead? 
in November of 1991. Do you think that's a coincidence? It's right after the Soviet Union fell. So he wasn't useful anymore. This guy was a super spy in the context of the Cold War. They stopped paying his bills. And that's why, you know, he had this corporate insolvency. It's because the whole operation was being sustained by his benefactors and in intelligence for the sake of using these publications as part of blackmail and in intelligence. And uh, anyway, long story short, he threatened the Mossad. He started by telling them, if you don't, if you don't reveal, you know, you don't keep paying me, I'm going to reveal X, Y, and Z. And said, "Oh, really?" And they said they sent some, you know, special operations people to drown him, to take him off the the Lady Gillen, the yacht that was named after his daughter, who was like his executive secretary, who knew everything that he was doing. Okay, so first thing to keep in context. Okay, she's the daughter of a triple agent super spy, who's been murdered by Mossad because he started threatening the state of Israel. OK, uh, and so and she knows everything. She's the only one in the family who was trusted with all of the highest level confidential information, unlike her brothers. And so this is a woman who not only is she in financial trouble around about 1991, uh, I mean, not, uh, beginning of 92, she's also in danger. I mean, they could kill her next. She uh, is aware of the whole operation. Uh, and who does she take refuge with? Well, the guy that daddy brought into the operation. Robert Maxwell brought Jeffrey Epstein to Israel and got him involved in arms dealing um, and uh, other kind of smuggling operations on behalf of Mossad, as well as blackmail on behalf of Mossad. What Jeffrey Epstein was doing, you know, people think like, oh, this is some sex scandal, like Lolita Express, like the guy was just a pervert. No, no, no. He was setting up prominent American and British politicians with underage girls so that film could be taken of them, of them so that the state of Israel could influence Western policy. Jeffrey Epstein's job was to grab the political leaders of the West by the balls, literally, to make sure they did what Israel said. That's just, and no one in the media wants to talk about that for obvious reasons, because then that feeds into the narrative, well, the Jews control you know, policy, et cetera, whatever. And then we're back to uh, the Kanye West stuff. Although what I want to say about Israel is that I do consider it to be a higher level civilization than much of the Middle East. And the fact that people do have a uh, modicum of freedom there to make their own decisions, I think there is something Promethean about that. As far as any nefarious stuff that goes on behind the scenes, of course, I wish all of that would be uh, not the case. Listen, listen, uh, to, my, to, to my great aggravation... OK, I've taken a lot of shit for this. Uh, I've repeatedly said I support the state of Israel. I've always been pro-Israel. It's always been my position. When I was involved in the and I've, and I've now since come come out with this very publicly, not only in Uberman, where I wrote about this in my last book, Uberman, also in Promethean Pirate, but in the video series that I, a series of interviews that I've released as well. People go to my YouTube channel, the Prometheism YouTube channel. You'll see a series of interviews I've done where I also talk about this, that at the height of my involvement in 2016 into 2017, I tried to engage with the state of Israel to broker an alliance between Iranian nationalists who wanted to overthrow the Islamic Republic or shift it dramatically in a nationalist rather than an Islamist direction, right, on the one hand, and then elements within the Israeli state who were sympathetic to Persia, because actually... Believe it or not, there is a certain contingent in the state of Israel who have a very deep respect for uh, the Persians, uh, in part because of the role that Cyrus the Great plays in the uh, in the Tanakh. I uh, met some of them actually at the uh, Me uh, Mecharen event. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, where I first found out about you, Jason. This was uh, back at the Untermeyer uh, Gardens. Right. right. So, I remember uh, that. Yeah. So yeah. so anyway, I had some uh, dealings with Mossad. And I dealt with at least four different agents of the Mossad. Uh, and for your information, before anybody claims yet again that you know I was on the take from the state of Israel or some, some shit, uh, I didn't take a single shekel from these people. In fact, at one point, they offered me money. At one point, they offered me a fairly you know, sizable amount of money. And I was so insulted because the point of my engagement with them was where conditions were supposed to be set for me to go with certain associates to um, 
I forget whether it was Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. I think by that time, some of the government offices had been moved to Jerusalem already. In any case, we were supposed to go to Israel and have meetings with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I really, I'm an idiot. I'm going to wind up getting myself killed. In any case, the, the person who was the point of contact was going to be the Israeli defense minister of the time, uh, mm -hmm. or Lieberman. And see, Lieberman was in with, he was in with Orthodox, more right-wing Jews in Israel, who, because of the place that Cyrus has as a Moshiach in the in the Tanakh, had a special connection to Iran, and they wanted an, an Iran that would be an ally of Israel. And unlike these other Israelis around Netanyahu, who want to basically destroy Iran as a nation, their idea is to not just overthrow the Islamic Republic; they want to crush and balkanize Iran and rape it for its resources, basically. And so if you remember what happened back then was Netanyahu kicked Lieberman out of the government and took over his position as defense minister. And that's when my operation came to an end. And so because we couldn't deal with Netanyahu, obviously. So and I, I do I am left to wonder why did Netanyahu kick Lieberman out? Did he come into possession of information about because, you know, Netanyahu is just psychopathically possessed with the idea of destroying Iran. And should it have come to his attention that his defense minister, Lieberman, was dealing with Iranian nationalists, whatever? Uh, you know, anyway, so that's a possibility. In any case, yeah, I dealt with a bunch of Mossad people. And I cut them off at the point at which they offered me money because I was horrendously insulted that here I am proposing this deep, like, uh, you know, diplomatic engagement and policy planning and like collaboration to try to to make significant change on both sides with a view to an eventual Iranian-Israeli alliance of the kind that, by the way, existed under the Shah during the Shah's regime. Uh, you know, SAVAK, the Iranian intelligence agency under the Shah, they worked very closely with Mossad. And, to, you know, just, I, I just need to take a minute to say this to these anti-Semites in the, in the Iranian opposition. The... Mossad came to the Shah through Savak in nine, around about 1977. And they said to him, your majesty, this Ayatollah Khomeini is going to become a real problem for you. We've seen this. Don't think like he's just some, you know, like an antiquated, you know, mullah who is just preaching this medieval nonsense. This guy is going to become a real problem for you. And by the way, he's going to be a problem for us too, if you let that happen. So please let us assassinate him. He's an Iranian citizen. We don't want to do this without approval from you. We don't want to kill one of your prominent ayatollahs without, but please let us, if you don't want to do it, I understand you don't want to kill a holy man, et cetera, whatever. Just let us take care of this problem for you. And the Shah didn't do it. Okay. And the rest is history. So for all those people who think that somehow like Israel conspired to destroy the Shah, it's a, it's a load of crap. So anyway, I was trying to create this alliance again between Iran and Israel, which I thought would be beneficial for the whole region. And I dealt with some of these people in Mossad, all of which is to say, long story, without taking a shekel from them. And I cut them off when they offered me money. I was horribly offended. Anyway, so point being, point being, I understand why Israel does what it does. OK, I understand if, if I were them in their position, I would probably do what they do. Right. So I don't. But, and, but here's the thing is that's never told to us in the media when this story, the same nonsensical garbage is, is, you know, regurgitated about, uh, you know, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell over and over in the media. Why are you blaming these low level, relatively low level operatives? Why don't you go point the finger at who was paying Jeffrey Epstein? Because you don't want to talk about how the state of Israel grabs American and British politicians by the balls, sets them up with 15 year old girls and films them in jets and beach resorts and whatever. OK, that's the reality of the situation. Now, I, I happen to think that something much deeper was going on. And I make this case in Promethean Pirate that, yes, Epstein was a Mossad operative. Uh oh, I hope that's been uh, a Mossad operative. Oh, here we go. Hello? Yeah, you're, back. you're back, yes. Her father had been a Mossad operative and then was killed by Mossad. So she was under duress. She could have potentially been an, a, a victim of a mm -hmm. Mossad assassination. And so she's kind of entrapped in this way, right? So she's letting Epstein just run this operation for the Israelis. Meanwhile, she developed a side operation, which had to do with these scientists who were 
being brought, like, you know, again, like I said, quantum physicists, geneticists, who were being brought to the Bahamas to study what could be reconstructed from Atlantis. And so she was using his intelligence connections in order to then spin off an operation on the side. And that's why they were done in. That's why Jeffrey Epstein is dead. Look, obviously he's dead and she's in a federal prison because they turned on the system. It's not because they're with the system that one of them got killed and the other's in prison. It's because whatever they did, they did something that pissed off the people that they were supposed to be answerable to, right? They went against mm -hmm. the system. I guess if I was in Jeffrey Epstein's position, though, with the uh, egg shape, you know what? I'm not sure I would be the best candidate to have this transhumanist uh, race that he wanted to... Uh, perpetuate using the dna of these uh girls allegedly so i don't know i mean then yeah, again I, I, I am i believe that probably all these caricatures you know and carnivalesque uh narratives are are very badly distorted you know um oblique reflections of the truth of the situation which was probably something a lot more complex not necessarily less disturbing maybe more <laughs> horrifying but probably a lot more com complex and less of a grotesque caricature, uh, you know, than, than what has, has leaked through, you know, some alternative media sources. It's possible. And again, with the temple thing, I just think things of that nature give a lot more fodder for people. I hope uh, just to end this particular thing, go to the super chats uh, as soon as possible, because I know Jason... By the way, let me just make a, yes. make a point here. It's very important sure. to just... I, for. Uh, Jeffrey sure. Epstein, in my book, is a scumbag. I mean, literally, in my book, he's a scumbag. I have him assassinated in Uberman. In Uberman, I tell an alternate <laughs> history, right? Mm. In Uberman, I have an alternate history unfold through time travel. The protagonist is a time traveler. And there's an alternate history where this protagonist, who's a time traveler assassin, she kills Jeffrey Epstein before he really, you know, mm. unfolds these operations and uh, before he entraps Gillan Maxwell. So, so in my book, the guy's a total scumbag. So I'm not... in. I am in no way trying to defend Jeffrey Epstein. Well, from uh, one of the things that you uh, said earlier uh, about your experience with just Lane Mac not, uh, with um, uh, Epstein, when there was this girl, teenage girl, who was going to the Dalton School, and uh, he was, uh, you know, he was recruiting her, and uh, when she was exiting the school building, you saw him wearing the uh, leather jacket, and. From how you described him, he seemed to be self-aware enough to see it being pretty shameful what he was doing, or at least that's the that's the impression that I got from how he described that particular scene. He was a creep, and you know I think that see I had a I don't want to get too much into this. Look, if people want it, they can read the book. Okay, yes. but I I he, anyone who runs intelligence operations at that level is also very good at reading people, okay? I think he was very good at reading people. And I had a connection to this girl, okay? And I think he could read that I was really disturbed and like that my, like, that he felt in, in a position that he needed to kind of justify himself somehow. Mm. Um, so, so I don't think he would have uh, been that way with just anybody. I think he felt the intensity of my, like, um revulsion and uh and concern uh so yeah very interesting i mean uh the one thing that i hope would happen not that it will happen but uh that we would not have to resort to having all of these blackmail operations and things of that nature if it could come to people's minds that, for example, and again, I don't know the inside baseball of it, but after those specific accords, which I think was way more Jared Kushner than it was uh, Donald Trump, were signed. I mean, now the Emirates and Israel are trading and with Saudi Arabia, like if people are not fighting against each other like they were in the very beginning, you know, post-World War II, if they're just trading with each other. And I know that that's uh, Jeffrey Mishlov's whole uh thing the uh you know the whole reason for live i, I don't want to speak about uh his particular stance here that much but the point being is that i don't think that's the reason why we do what we do but it's still nice to have this ability to exchange goods and resources and not to fight 
At least I think that that's a, it's a welcome change, and I hope that that's going to be the case with Israel and Iran in the future. Yeah, I have a big problem with that. Um, the the whole nature of the relationship between Israel, the Saudis, and the Emirates, which, by the way, is now, just as of this week, being threatened because China has just be initiated a new alliance with Saudi Arabia. The Saudis betrayed the United States. They've gone over to China. Oh, the Saudis have completely, they betrayed the United States, they've gone over to China, and China just betrayed the Islamic Republic of Iran, which two years ago it had signed a 25-year development agreement with, okay? So the Chinese just threw the Iranians under the bus, Saudis, you know, betrayed America, and the Chinese and the Saudis have made a pact, and in the joint statement that they made, they attacked Israel. So, so this may change, but okay, rewinding back to Jared Kushner's yeah. era, my problem with that is that that whole alliance between Israel, the Saudis and the Emiratis and all that was being set up so that Israel would have their support in a war against Iran. It was setting the conditions for a war against Iran. And the one thing that I have always respected about the Islamic Republic of Iran, about this regime, is that it has resisted the current world order. It has resisted the international finance system and basically the corrupt, you know, oligarchy that governs this planet. Uh, and so what I was trying to do back in the days when I was attempting to engage in a dialogue with the Israelis was to bring a kind of certain elements, very unusual elements in the Iranian opposition that are as opposed to the global oligarchy as the Islamic Republic is, right? They're against Islamic theocracy. They want Iranian, Iranian culture, let's say, okay, yeah. to be promoted instead. Uh, but they are also against the oligarchy the way that this regime is. And so I wanted those elements to be able to ally with factions in Israel that are also not on the page of the existing like international cartel system, right? The existing syndicate, right? A lot of these anti-Semites have this ridiculous like one dimensional like cardboard cutout image of Israel as the, well, I mean, not just the poster child, but potentially the orchestra global financial system and oligarchical syndicate and whatever. No, no, no. There are very powerful forces in Israel that are against that. And if anyone had any understanding of the history of Israel and how important the kibbutz movement was and what a kind of socialistic movement that was, right, they would understand that there is this faction in Israel that's very mm. opposed to the global cabal. And it was that faction that I was trying to bring into contact with Iranian nationalists who are equally opposed to the global cabal. In a way, it also reminds me of what you were talking about in relation to the CIA, because I personally believe that I don't believe in like this full anarchy. Like the, I believe institutions do play their role, separation of powers, having a court system, you know, having lawyers, having the ability to gain justice through, you know, even if they're imperfect through whichever means are here in the United States regarding institutions when you have something like the cia i believe that there are members of their uh, organization as well as others who are patriotic who do want the best for america and then i'm sure there are a good share of like psychopaths who want there to be some world order type of thing and when people criticize these things i just don't like the very very uh, small-minded mentality of saying like well this is like all good and this is all bad where you would be able to actually look at what are the people specifically standing for and be in favor of what they stand for and work to have that kind of an organization or institution as opposed to just saying well this is all good or this is all bad yeah i absolutely agree with that well with with that let's go on to uh, super chats jason this has been too short as always, I look forward to talking to you uh, way more. There is so much we have yet to uh, cover here, but let us go to the Super Chats. And by the way, we got a new patron for Break the Rules today. Thank you so much for becoming a patron today. And uh, you can become a patron and help support the show by going to patreon.com slash break the rules. You're going to see it above here. I'm going to post the link in the chat. And uh, doing so is going to give you the MP3s of the episodes after they come out. Exclusive Patreon-only get-togethers. We just had one recently with uh, Mason Musso, whose brother was like the star of Hannah Montana. And a uh, very, very interesting guy. And uh, we talked about a lot of stuff. So I would love to get to know all the patrons and have these get-togethers on a regular basis, maybe a monthly or uh, two times a month as well as getting rewards. If you are fans of uh, these beautiful wood cu uh, cut 
sculptures that my father, Alexander Polyakov, creates. I'm going to put them on the screen over here so you can take a look at them. You can get these very beautiful magnets when you become a $20 patron. And if you become a $50 patron, you are going to get a custom magnet. So whatever design you want, well, within limits, my uh, father's going to be able to create that for you. Maybe you want like a design of uh, Prometheus or, uh, I don't know, your Atlas. So we'll figure that out. But uh, anyway, uh, also uh, Discord privileges as well. There is a BTR Discord, which I highly recommend you join. I'm going to post the link in there as well. So super chat time. This is going to be very quick. We have two super chats, so tombs and temples. And also send those super chats right now uh, for a limited time before this is over. Tombs and temples, $5. Happy to have caught this. At the risk of sounding infantile, I'll ask, is thought energy? Maybe a better question is, is consciousness energy? Le Lev, I completely missed the question. We lost Okay, the I'll do it one, one more time, one more time. You froze exactly for the duration of the question. Go ahead. Okay, uh, here, here it is. Happy to have caught this. At the risk of sounding infantile, I'll ask, is thought energy? Maybe a better question is, is consciousness energy? Yes, everything is energy. So, so... Okay, to give a little bit more of a nuanced response. There is this uh, philosophical idea and um, basically um, it, it's, it's in a school of Indian philosophy that uh, Gautama Buddha was coming out of himself uh, and that you see reflected very clearly in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali uh, where the world is uh, fundamentally divided into uh, prana and akasha. And so there's a sense of a kind of a, a, a cosmos of energy and then mind, which is separate from the energy. So there's just like, in a way, you could say it's substance dualism in an Indian philosophical context, in a way. It's like Cartesian substance dualism in an Indian context. And I reject that. I don't think that there is this prana that's separate from an Akashic energy. I think it's all energy. Everything is energy. With that, before the uh, second uh, super chat, one thing I forgot to mention is I was reading a uh, biography of Nikola Tesla that was uh, written by a, a childhood friend of his, where the friend, I don't remember his name, but he was talking about how when Tesla had these various uh, visions where he could you know, see very complex things, he experienced a um, sensation in the spine, I believe, when he was breathing in and out. And the act of breathing in and out had a lot to do with it. To me, just because I'm experiencing that as well on a regular basis, is very synonymous with what people describe to be kundalini. This, uh, e uh, this energy that it's in your base of the spine that moves up and down. So I'm curious, Jason, have you ever experienced anything of that sort? Um, during my childhood at certain points. Uh, yeah. Um, and I, I think that this is a legitimate observation on that guy's part, the author of this book, because Tesla also managed somehow to get by, not get by, to be incredibly productive and energetic with only four hours of sleep a night. Wow. Maybe I should meditate even more and get less sleep. No, I like sleeping. Anyway, final super chat here from Sam Fisher. Canadian dollars, $27.99. Thank you so much, Sam. In Faustian Futurist, I find it interesting that the Atlanteans are creatively and artistically stagnant, but still have sadistic sexual vices. On one hand, they're gods. On the other, they're no better than humans. Well, are the Olympian gods any better than humans? I mean... This is what I describe in Faustian Futurist is entirely consistent with the Greeks' accounts of the behavior of the Olympian gods. They are lustful sadists. Indeed. And uh, Zeus turned this poor lady into a cow. Yeah. That's, that sucks. I like cows, though, figures, but it's like... That figures in the Prometheus story. Yeah, I, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, imagine being like a, somebody stuck in the body of a cow. I mean, that's like it's, the one... kind of a, it's kind of a comical scene in the Prometheus <laughs> story because here's Prometheus talking to this cow while he's chained to the rock. You know, there's this conversation. It's almost a cartoon. And yeah. Prometheus is like empathizing with this cow. Like, yeah, I know it's rough. He's a sadist, man. And the cow's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like oh, we have another super chat here from uh, who... a car claymation cartoon of that. Oh, absolutely. No, there are so many 
I'm an animator, by the way. I make animated um, works, and I would definitely love to do something like that or the Book of Enoch. Like, there's so many subjects that I think have not been properly uh, animated that definitely should be. But anyway, Slinky Bopper 499, you said mathematics is a schema and does not relay truth. Are there more appropriate schemas to pursue or study for a path to enlightenment? Oh, man. <laughs> this is one of those questions that has so many assumptions baked into it. Um, so first of all, enlightenment. I mean, what is enlightenment? Okay. I mean, that's, you could mean that five different ways or whatever, you know, you could mean it in the sense of the European enlightenment. You could mean it the way that the Buddhists mean enlightenment, you know, that's all. So I'm just going to bracket that, but let's say for the sake of greater understanding, right? It's not that there's some schema other than mathematics that's preferable. It's that you should use as many schema as possible. This is the point I make in Prometheus and Atlas that, we need to develop a post-paradigmatic science. We need to develop a kind of science which is not constrained by one particular paradigm, nor does it commit itself to some new paradigm which is putatively more accurate than the old paradigm. No, we need to get to a place where we recognize that scientific theories are tools. They are not mirrors of objective structures in nature. And you can use different scientific theories and even entirely different paradigms simultaneously in order to accomplish different purposes, right? Like Newtonian physics is incredibly useful to get rockets to the moon or to Mars. Yes. But quantum theory is more appropriate for other purposes, like let's say sending signals very rapidly across space. That might be an application of quantum theory. So you use different, and, and so that's why these people who are trying to reconcile relativity theory and quantum theory and try to make them like subsets of some new larger theory, they're mistaken. They're mis they, they assume that these theories are both somehow wrong about objective reality. No, theories are models. These two models accomplish different purposes. So I think we should use all kinds of schema simultaneously, depending on what our aim is, practically speaking. Mm. And uh, we didn't even get to the underwater caverns that would be constructed by the prometheus uh, pirate civilization that you were talking about the one question though that i had about that and then we could wrap this up the one question that i had about that is wouldn't those areas also be like uh, before asteroids just like if we're focusing on the water wouldn't those areas especially the area in between uh south america and uh, antarctica already potentially have been occupied by the breakaway civilization because those seem to be the areas where the ufos that were reported end up going underwater so i don't know what you think about that i think we should find out all right yeah maybe they'll say no no room go somewhere else but anyway let me, let me just add on yeah. that note that that i believe that that is what Ghislaine maxwell was trying to do with terramar that it's not a coincidence that at the time that she launched the Terramar project, which was putatively for the sake of ocean conservation and more detailed mapping of the seafloor and um, the restriction of national claims on international waters, it's no coincidence that at the same time she got involved with a person who, who eventually she secretly married, um, who ran a, a, a cargo shipping lane monitoring company, Cargometrics, uh, and the Scott Borgerson character who, who very much has the profile of a naval intelligence officer, his specialty was Antarctica and the waters around Antarctica. And so I do think that, and I, I make this case in, in Promethean Pirate, that she was uh, trying to snoop around to see what might already be down there and, uh, and uh, what could be put down there. Um, in areas where maybe there there hasn't been any development. Mm. Oh, and final final question: Do you think that humans have a certain resonance, for lack of a better word, with something like the sun being outside? That a colonial life somewhere on an asteroid or a comet would still not really be that sufficient for proper development, or can we go okay without you know without the sun? Can we go okay without the sun? Yes. Uh, yeah, we could. We could. I mean, look, I mean, interstellar travel, we would be without our sun during interstellar travel. And the first of all, it's not that the sun doesn't reach the asteroid belt. Well, certainly reaches the, it reaches the planets beyond the asteroid belt. The sun even reaches the Oort cloud, which I talk about. Yes. Okay. 
Now, it's much dimmer, obviously. You know, there's a lot less solar radiation that reaches the Oort cloud. But there's no more reason why you would need solar radiation there than you would need it for interstellar travels. Because my idea in terms of colonizing the Oort cloud, I mean, it's not my idea. I mean, the idea that I'm, I'm picking up on from certain engineers is that you have these kilo many kilometers wide icy objects in the Oort cloud. And what you would do is you would take a... Uh, rotating spaceship, you know, a spaceship that rotates in order to produce artificial gravity. And you would use a nuclear tunnel boring machine to carve a hole into this uh, comet that's orbiting in the Oort cloud. And there's trillions of these. You carve out a, a cylindrical cavity inside the comet using a nuclear um, uh, boring device. And then the rotating spaceship is inserted into the cavity with the comet as a shell around it. And, with the, and then you can shut up, then, you, then it's not a question of propulsion. The rotation is maintained to create artificial gravity, but then you just move with the comet as it orbits in, in the Oort cloud. And so that's my idea. So, so there, there's no difference uh, between that and using that same rotating spaceship for interstellar travel. Your energy would be coming from nuclear fusion or, as I propose, ultimately zero-point energy, and you wouldn't need any solar uh, radiation for any purpose. And in terms of, like, our health needs, uh, you know, the, 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 the ways in which, you know, the sun's radiation is important to our health, well, we already have UV systems and so forth that um, artificially can reproduce that and provide similar nutrients and, and so well not just the sun's rays but if you were bringing up the example of the moon as being this vessel that takes souls in that opens the doors to these planets including this big star that we call the sun as also having a very particular effect on who we are and how we conduct ourselves what i don't know is to what extent like to what extent can we attribute uh, something like the sun or give the sun any kind of, let's say, spiritual, uh, for lack of a better word, significance or any kind of consciousness that would in turn affect us and being further away from it, if that would have any effect on us. No, I don't think the sun has any consciousness. OK, maybe consciousness is the wrong word here, but just <laughs> any kind of yeah, like, I think it's uh, a yeah. reactor. And, okay. And Okay, no, no, that's fine. I just thought... Well, like, yeah, listen, I don't want to be overly... I, I think planets have something like consciousness, though. Like, I do believe in this Gaia theory that the collective ecosystem of the Earth may have some kind of an emergent mind to it, that, you know, that we, we may be in some kind of a... And that's a very... We, that's a long rabbit hole we could go down some other time. That, next time, next time. Nested hierarchy of a super organism, and does the ecosystem of the Earth as a whole have a certain kind of mind... I mean, this was the idea that was explored by Stanislav Lem in Solaris, which then Andrei Tarkovsky took and made into a, a fantastic science fiction. Yeah. Ecosystem or ego system. Anyway, with that, uh, Jason, thank you very much uh, for being here. I always love these conversations and I look forward to uh, the next one. Is there, well, obviously your book, Pr uh, Promethean Pirate, please guys pick it up right now. You can find that on Amazon, uh, any other any other thing you would want to plug anything uh anything else? my youtube channel you know maybe uh stick a link in the description for this yes. video to my youtube channel because there's as i said a series of interviews that i put out recently that have to do with promethean pirate you can see them from the thumbnail image that uh that features the cover of the book excellent well with that guys thank you so much for watching be sure to smash that subscribe button smash the like button click the bell the bell is very important so that you get notified every time break the rule rules comes on the air and please share this with all of your loved ones friends with everybody you know just like after this video is over just take uh, the address bar copy paste or click the share button and just share this to everybody so thank you guys so much for watching till next time i'm your host love poliakov at love po on twitter and also be 
be sure to subscribe to the uh, Discord server. If you guys are not on the Discord, I don't know what you're doing with yourselves because Discord is where it's at. It's where the Break the Rules community is being formed as we speak. That is it. And also Patreon.com slash Break the Rules. That is it. That is not it. Patreon.com slash Break the Rules. Become a patron today. You are not going to regret it. Become a patron and you are going to help this grow. Break the Rules. Bring everybody together so as to break all the bubbles and the circles and uh, find out what exactly we're all missing out on. Thank